actually think I think it might actually help us. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I think that's really incredible. I think um, I do want to open up for questions. Uh, there's a lot more that we could obviously talk about, but everyone's been uh, listening to us. So, um, are there any questions from the audience? Do we have a mic that we're going to pass them around? Over there? Or one there? I think there's a mic and a stand back there. And back there. I'll start with the gentleman at the front, please. Yes, uh, please. Yes, please. Hello? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. So you've spoken a lot tonight about defining death and about resuscitation. Um, in the context of resuscitation, how do you find, define acceptable life? In other words, now that we can prognosticate better, now that we have a larger window to resuscitate, uh, what are the ethics and what are the pragmatics of bringing someone back if they might not have motor control or they might have greatly diminished mental capacity or they might not even have a, their former personality? Where do you draw that line? It, you mind, right? Because as I, I'm a the neurointensivist, Here's how it works. We're, the neural person's called in to give their best guesstimate. And if that sounds scary, it kind of is. Um, you just give you, and you kind of talk in rough categories of, you know, bed bound, hobbling with a cane, but able to go home, or really pretty good, and, and, and such. But you're dealing with eventualities. And, you know, I always say the thing is, these are all just kind of, uh, percentages, but everyone's got one story. Like you've got to work with the family to do your best to make the decisions that you think best reflect what the patient would want. And the hardest part is some sometimes helping that disconnect. I mean, I've had families literally say. He'd never want to live like this if what I'm hearing, the chances of a good neuro outcome are such. But I just can't bring myself to do it. Literally, folks say that. And that's when they really need therapy, counseling, chaplain, and that kind of thing. But it is, it is a rough, it, it, is, it is a very approximate art. The important thing that I say, though, is, is if you're going to go for it, you can always change the plan later to comfort cut bait so to speak right so it's important that that what if we made the wrong decision and we're creating a, a life in the existence that dad wouldn't want right well then you can always go for comfort later so that's the best uh, yeah and i think this this is such a hard problem and and i think what we struggle with is that i can't define for somebody who is unresponsive critically ill in a bed what their ideal quality of life is. And we engage families, we engage you know, friends, we engage the people in the room who are making the decisions for that individual. And what we've actually learned from talking to those people who have made really hard decisions for family members is that they have a definition. We need to kind of sort out what that definition is. Because I think sometimes we come into these conversations and we say things like, I don't know if they're going to be bed bound. Do they want a trach? Do they want a peg? Do they want, and we use all these big medical terms. And I've had people say to me, if my dad could just be at my wedding, that's enough. Or I think that my dad would just be happy to have a grandchild sit on their lap. And I think we need to kind of try and figure out what that quality is. I've even had families say to me, they kept saying he had a bad quality of life before his cardiac arrest. And they were so offended. And I think we have to be very careful as we approach this conversation, because it's not about my definition of quality. It's about that individual who can't tell us their definition of quality. And the people who know that the best are the people who are sitting around the table. And I do think, that, you know, to, to agree 100%, we often get into this dichotomous, you know, are we going to go or are we going to stop? And the reality is, you can keep trying, and you can still say, all right, now it's too much. Day five, day seven, now it's too much. And, and everyone will respect that. I think when we start getting really aggressive and saying, oh gosh, we have to put a trach in on day three, so therefore, let's make a decision right now, I think that's actually not fair to the family. I also think it's not fair to the individual playing in the bed who can't answer those questions. But I think the, the biggest key with this is really querying the people who know that person and really kind of working through that process, because sometimes it's not as easy as, 
you know, a few days in, a, in an LTEP, a long-term, you know, vent wean, or a, sometimes it's as nuanced as I, I think they would be happy if they could even just, you know, be around for their, their children. And that's, that, that's their value, not ours. Thank you for sharing your stories and your perspectives. I think it's, I'm, I'm really struck by the stories that um, that these these patients with these near death and death, return from death experiences uh, share. And um, it really reminds me of, uh, so Michael Pollan published a book uh, in the past year called uh, How to Change Your Mind. And he summarizes a lot of research that's been, that's been done on uh, people undergoing the psychedelic experience. <laughs> So people, uh, they, they have the, he summarizes studies of people do, doing, um, you know, people that were either given uh, psilocybin or LSD, uh, as well as uh, people that are expert meditators. And they, they see this common theme of um, the people in the resting state have what's called the default mode network in their brain that's active. It's kind of like your resting state. Um, and it's responsible for the generation of the self, like the, the recognition of self. And they find that in these people, in these, distinct conditions, both meditation and under these psychedelic drugs, experience a quieting of the deepest default mode network. And that correlates with a, a sensation of what people appropriately call ego death, um, which is when they start feeling this connection with the universe um, and connection with other people, and this sense of infinite love. And I'm curious if, if, you've, if anybody's discussing the, the potential parallels between the quieting of the default mode network and Blood and I, um, let me, so if I may, may I just ask this uh, very quickly. I think that the, the key thing to appreciate you know, is we've been studying people's experiences for years. We've had literally hundreds if not thousands of cases that we've analyzed. Um, the point I'd like to make is that um, the, the, the tools that people are using to compare drug-induced experiences with experience at the end of life, the tools themselves, the research scales are very inaccurate. For example, you could take a research scale that's trying to define a so-called near-death experience it has things like, did you feel love? Well, everyone in this room has felt love. Did you feel peace? I guarantee anyone who lives in New York, if you take me out of the city for a few hours, <laughs> to a mountain top or somewhere, I promise you, I will feel incredible peace. I'm right here. You just need three or four features. You know, Did you experience a sort of a sense of uh, happiness? Yes. So you put these in, and then you suddenly have scored a, a death experience. The problem is the scales were not designed appropriately, and they're being used to compare different experiences. What I can say for sure, is that we have studied uh, experiences induced by drugs as well, and actually there are a lot of differences uh, between them uh, and the experience people have at the end of life. But of course, there are commonalities, like people experience love, they experience peace, they experience different things. So I don't know if we have answers, but except to say that we have to do a lot more research in that area. Um, and I just realized there were other people, and I'll, I'll come to the gentleman over there, I just knew there were other people who had, yes, in the audience who wanted to. I, I would like to ask, how common is it in New York City or beyond for a person who has cardiac arrest or stroke to receive the kind of aggressive and ongoing treatment that you've described? Is it uncommon, common? I mean, what are your chances? Uh, right. Lifelong New Yorker. I love this question. Well, I guess we're Super questions. fast. Quick, quick answer. It, it needs questions. to be a lot more common. Uh, to be quite honest, it, like just take hypothermia, right? In 2007, no one was being fooled. And we were getting transfers at Columbia. You know all those transfers were? Doctors and nurses that had cardiac arrests. Now, 10 years later, it's pretty much the standard of care in New York City. ECPR, ECMO, as a bridge to some definitive treatment right now is almost unheard of in New York City. It's happening in Japan. Uh, it's happening in, in other parts of the world. Uh, and it's happening in Minnesota and being test studied more. Well, one thing that everyone can do, even if we can't get ECPR, because certainly at my institution. We define ECPR, I don't uh, remember it. The, the bypass yeah. to try. One thing that we all can do is to learn CPR. Um, because even right now in the United States, our, our, our utilization of, of community bystander CPR is dramatically low. So I think we see about 35% on national average. And so European countries are seeing 70%. So we need to really, um, even if we can't get these amazing therapies across the country right now, um, one thing that we all can do is good community and good bystander CPR, because that actually helps outcomes too. It, and it, all you need is a pair of hands. You can learn it in 30 minutes. 
and it more than doubles life. So you and you have an 80% chance if you use it that you will use it on a loved one to save their life. And 911 will even talk them through it. Yeah. What you don't know is we're going to plan to do CPR on it before they leave. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yes, um, um, uh, this whole discussion has some religious overtones. I'd like to go down the list or, or across, across the panel um, and ask each of you just a simple yes or no. Can I tell you something? I do apologize. There are other questions too. Could you okay. just pick on one person? Because I want to get, no. Melanie won't invite me back if I don't. This thing, okay. Uh, Dr. Parnia, do you no. consider yourself religious? No, I don't consider myself religious, and I'm glad you're asking me because I didn't get involved in any of this because of anything to do with religion at all. And I also don't believe, and with all respect, I, I respect people's opinions. But I want to explain that religion is very difficult to address because it is so cultural. There are so many aspects of it. What, what, do, what do we even mean when we talk about it? What I do think, though, is that it should be physicians and scientists who are trying to explore what happens when we die. However, at the core, I and mean, this is the part that I do believe, you know, however you want to talk about it, at the core of many faiths, many beliefs, many systems of thought throughout time, there is this importance on morality, on your humanity. I absolutely believe on that. Whoever tells me, I believe it 100%. And the patients who come back talk about that as well. The, nobody actually comes back and talks about the rituals and the cultures that they learn, by the way. I have to point that out too. So since it was one question, I'll answer that. Um, I think the lady over there had a question. Did you have a question? Do you have a mic that, uh, that... It was sort of addressed. Oh, okay. Any other questions? I'm hoping it's a quick question about just language and how we phrase things. At one of my hospitals, the entire system, you can't use DNR. The forms all say allow for natural death. And I've always thought hey, that's, that's sort of a nice way of phrasing things because I guess the, the whoever came up with this one was very pessimistic about what DNR could do. But based off what you guys must have learned this morning and where resuscitation science is going, do you think that that's a harmful phraseology or an inaccurate phraseology? It's awesome. I like that. I like it. I think, you know, I, I do like it. I, I think there's something universal about DNR that's helpful. Um, and I only say this because I happen to work in a place that's right smack in the middle of the country and we see a lot of people arriving at our door who are not from Denver, Colorado. Um, and so I think there's something nice about a universal term um, in terms of its applicability and its kind of implementation. Uh, I think some of my colleagues would see that and say, shoot, does this mean I do it or I don't do it? Um, but aside from that, the terminology I think is great. Um, but in terms of the application, how that would carry to other institutions, I think people would get really nervous about should I or should I not. I think most people get it. You see, allow for natural death. In other words, DNR. <laughs> As an AI doctor, I would <laughs> and, and also, I'm not the first person. Often people are seen by an EMS provider, and so I think it would be a little complicated. That's so. <laughs> what I would have. Any experience with holotropic breathing? I believe that Tibetans use with force hyperventilation to try to generate some psychic. I, I don't know anything about that, and I think we're really trying to explore what happens when people die. What, what kind of breathing are you getting? Uh, Tibetan breathing. Called holotropic. Is that extra piece on the holotropic? Yeah. 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 I thought you asked people's brain when you really injured. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, the, the point is that most of the when you when you read the descriptions of the phenomena, it's exactly the same. The same. In the, the law of the world. You're, you're addressing an interesting point, which is that, um, again, as I said, we don't own death, we don't ex we own the experience of death, and I forgot to touch on this, which is that you know, there are historical accounts of people, even going back to Plato's Republic, you know, I see there are apparently descriptions in biblical descriptions of people who come back to life, um, and we, t we showed a picture, a painting from Hieronymus Bosch from the 15th or 16th century that showed what looks like a classical experience, somebody going through a tunnel towards a light. So I, I'm sure that, I don't know how, but I'm sure throughout different cultures, different history, and different civilizations, people have had experiences that relate to death, and they're probably, what's interesting is that they're probably universal and consistent with what we're seeing today, uh, including the small children. Uh, yes, I think this will be the last question for the evening. Uh, so 
I think there's a mic. Maybe you could just perhaps use the mic over there, which is really possible. Okay, my question is just about um, the various skeptics um, and how they explain the near-death experience. Um, I was wondering what your take is on their explanation about the visual, um, the tunnel of light, how people see the tunnel of light, and um, they attribute it to possible the visual cortex and how it creates patterns in the brain that are similar to the tunnel, and also how they then um, explain, or maybe they don't, they can't explain, uh, people uh, who have, who've had these near death experiences corroborating events and uh, procedures that the doctors did while they were not conscious or even seeing things in um, another room that were there then corroborated by their relatives or doctors. I think um, the, the reality is, you know, death is death is a mystery. Um, and I think what we're seeing and we're putting out is the elephant in the room, you know, that people, like anything, right, that look at things from their own perspective. And when you're looking at a new phenomena that we can't explain, in other words, death was easy, that was the end, there was nothing to talk about. And then suddenly you find there are different phenomena going on. Um, people have tried to explain it. There are incredible theories, like the fact that maybe when your oxygen levels are going down in your brain, you're starting to imagine this tunnel. But <clears throat> none of them have been validated by any research studies. And that's the point I'd like to make. We all deal with patients who have low oxygen levels. Nobody comes back and says, oh, as my oxygen is dropping, I'm starting to see a bit of a tunnel. But from a theory perspective, it was a very good theory. I think I'd, I'd like to say, and, I, and end this with that, that essentially we have gone into a new and uncharted territory. And that is really what that is. And like a lot of things, sometimes we find that our models that we create that can explain one phenomena can no longer explain the data that is coming through. And that's what makes us start to change and rethink uh, the ways that we think about things. So you don't have answers, but just to say that um, it, it really can't be explained quite as easily as people have tried to do, although I understand why. Um, you don't have anything to add with it. I'm going to actually end the session tonight before I ask Melanie to come back with just a, a, something I read recently from Alan Alda. And just going back to this point, the actor Alan Alda recently was quoted as saying, it's amazing that most of us live as if we're not going to die. And the reality is I think what we're trying to show tonight here is that there is a scientific understanding about what happens when we die. It also touches upon our personal, cultural, religious, philosophical, psychological notions. Um, but at least what I'm glad to say is that we have a science that's coming together. Even if we can't answer everything right now, and that we're all looking at it from different facets, whether psychology, philosophy, theology, medicine, biology, I'm sure that there will be a unified science at some point, that will explain everything and, and, and put it all together for us. But I think the key thing is just to appreciate that we're just starting on that process. So I hope this has been a helpful uh, session for everyone. I hope none of us face our death. I uh, hope we all find happiness. Uh, do look up Sonia more than you look up me. Uh, but if unfortunately you end up in that situation, we'll do our best. That we can.